I always hate disturbing the warm buzz of conversation that, that precedes talks like this. And uh, the only reason I don't mind doing it too much because I know we'll kind of continue through the whole afternoon and then and then come back bubbling afterward to talk. And that's the kind of warm buzz of conversation we really want to keep going here this evening. So thank you all of you for coming. I expect even though the weather, we might have a few more filtering in. So those of you nearest the aisle, which is the one way out of this room, um, please uh, more come in to, to, to settle down and, and make room for more. Um, my name is Christian DuPont, and I'm the director of the John J. Burns Library for Rare Books and Special Collections and Archives here at, at Boston College. And it's really my pleasure to welcome you here um, and uh, on behalf of, of the DC libraries. Uh, before introducing Donald Ryan to you, I would like on this occasion of his Boston College debut to introduce you to Donald. And I say debut because as many of you know, uh, we greatly are greatly privileged to be acquiring Donald's literary archives in the Burns Library. Uh, and so we can look forward to, to having Donald back with us on many occasions in the years and indeed decades to come. You and your work, Donald, have a new home, second home here on the Heights. And so we bid you welcome on behalf of Boston College, the Burns Library, the DC Libraries, many of my library colleagues here with us. And if I may, I would like, uh, on behalf of our Consul General of Ireland, Funeral Quinlan, uh, to offer a very special and warm welcome to you. Uh, we're delighted to have you with us on this occasion, uh, especially since you'll be doing a little leave taking from us uh, here in Boston for a couple of weeks uh, back to Ireland. So it's a plan, I'm glad that you're here with us tonight because you've really given us such tremendous uh, supports here at Boston College and, of course, for the, uh, the greater Boston community uh, for Irish arts and cultures in so many ways. And I trust that you have been seeing announcements about Boston's second annual Irish Writers Festival, uh, Bulla Boston. Uh, which you know has helped to organize and to sponsor along with the Irish Writer Center and Poetry Ireland. And if you didn't catch the clever wordplay, Bulla Boston uh, means Bulla Boston for applause in Irish, and, uh, but some of you might recognize it as that uh, 2009 Cranberries Live album, and don't we miss, <laughs> and don't we miss Laura Sarudin on this occasion? Um, so, um, uh, so Bulla Boston will be held uh, at the Harvard Club, Boston on March 2nd and 3rd, so not this Friday, but the one following, so coming up very soon. Uh, it's free, everyone's welcome. Uh, we do ask you to, to register online. If you just Google that or Irish uh, um, uh, events there on March 2nd and 3rd, you'll find it through. You have some brochures, which will go out uh, afterward, even at the book signing table, okay? Uh, so let's do that. But uh, to give you a little uh, uh, foretaste of that, we have poets uh, Paul Muldoon and, and Robert Pinsky on Friday evening. Saturday afternoon, we'll feature a conversation with one of our former Burns visiting scholars, uh, Alan Jackson, and Boston Globe columnist uh, Kevin Cullen. And also, West of Ireland novelists Mary Costello and Sally Rooney will be introduced by Mary Molly uh, Mopluski. So um, we'll be uh, looking forward to that uh, soon here, so pick up some information afterward. Uh, we're also very pleased to have uh, with us this evening Professor James H. Murphy, uh, director of the Center for Irish Programs here at Boston College, and wonderful collaborated in, in, in many ways in events uh, like this and a uh, co-sponsor of this evening program. So thank you, James, and the Center for Irish Programs. Um, speak of our Burns Visiting Scholar Program, uh, many of you come to our, our, uh, our Burns Scholar events uh, regularly, uh, the fall and the, uh, and the spring. In the spring, we're very pleased to have with us Jason Kirk from Central Washington University to destroy, who will be uh, hosting, uh, coming up in April, a provocatively titled symposium, Is There an American School of Irish History? question mark, and the answer come on April 7th to find out. It will be hotly debated among a dozen panelists that you've assembled, and we thank you for, for doing that. And then uh, we'll give you, Jason, the spotlight there on April 18th, on a Wednesday evening, uh, for um, a lecture on the development of parliamentary opposition in the Irish Free State, which is your specialty. So you'll see announcements uh, about that. And look on the Irish Studies website, look on the Burns Library website. If you're not getting emails from us, see me afterward. I'll hand your card, and we'll make sure to get you on a mailing list. Uh, also present with us this evening are several of our, our regular faculty members who teach in our Irish Studies program. I'd like to mention in, in, in particular uh, James Smith. Um, Jim Smith, because he has collaborated with me in many ways in putting together uh, Donald's really, uh, two and a half day visit with us here and bringing your experience uh, uh, as director of our renowned Lowell Humanities series and planning events and, and coordinating like this. So thank you, Jim, for, for doing this. And, and Donald will be joining you in class tomorrow with your students and for lunch afterward and, 
and we really thank you for the time that you're, you're giving to our students. And, uh, uh, and, and on that note, I can mention Elizabeth Graver, Suzanne Matson, who are sitting together as co-director of our uh, creative writing concentration. And uh, just before coming over here this afternoon, we uh, had Donald with us with uh, uh, several students in the concentration, Elizabeth uh, in Burns Library, looking at uh, and talking about Donald's archives and what it's meant for him to, to have them come here uh, to Boston College and, uh, and develop your career as a writer. So it's really a special moment for many of our students. I think some of you have come over for us. And we thank you for joining us for the talk this evening. Um, especially now that you're teaching creative writing full time at the University of Limerick. So uh, that was a nice thing to do with our program here. Uh, we're very pleased to have with us uh, faculty members from another, a number of other Irish Studies program uh, around New England even uh, this evening. Uh, certainly Tom McGrady is here from, uh, from UMass Boston. Um, Kelly Matthews from Birmingham State who is also helping to uh, uh, co-organizing the uh, American Conference of Irish Studies annual meeting in spring 2019 here in Boston. Uh, Boston-based conference, so we're delighted there. Um, Mary Burke hasn't come in yet. I think she's still on the road from, from Stores, Connecticut, uh, and we taught there this morning, University of Connecticut, so she'll be joining us here uh, this evening as well. So we're delighted. We, we really try to, to say, well, introducing you, uh, us to you, that uh, that's a lot of what's, uh, what we do here in Boston, is bring our studies together in so many ways. Uh, we also have a very good uh, friend of yours, um, so this is introducing Alan Hayes, actually, in the back corner there, who's uh, the publisher of Marlin House, the, uh, and uh, who's been doing research visits with us uh, this week in Burns Library before heading down to New York, and it's very nice, Alan, that your visit coincided uh, remarkably with, <laughs> with, uh, with Donald's talk here this evening. Um, I also see in our audience Donald, uh, Tom Carty, uh, put you on the spot again, Tom, president of the Era Society of Boston, an Irish cultural organization that has had close connections to Boston College since its founding in the Irish constitutional year of 1937. And I also see members of our charitable Irish Society, the oldest Irish organization in North America, founded in 1737. And, raise your hand, if you're affiliated with, I'm going to run off the list here, the Irish International Immigration Center, the Irish Pastoral Center, Irish Cultural Center of New England, the American, uh, American uh, Irish American Partnership, the Boston Irish Business Association, the Kumanek Whaling in Boston. <laughs> uh, or if you're a member of the AOH, or the LAOH, or Tiara, okay? Um, so, and you were hoping to, to get a little breathing space from the Irish by hopping on that plane yesterday in Shannon, but, uh, but here you go. Um, but be assured, those of you from well, all these various Irish cultural and uh, immigrant aid societies, and um, that we're also making sure that Donald gets a taste of, of, of literary Boston. Boston um, at large. So uh, tomorrow afternoon, for instance, we'll be visiting and meeting with the director and program staff, uh, members of reading groups from the Boston Athenaeum, uh, one of our literary centers uh, in the city here. Uh, earlier this afternoon, we had planned, uh, apart from Ellis, a chat with, uh, with Chris Boucher, also uh, managing a poster of the magazine. So uh, again, it's really important for us to recognize that um, although Donald is, of course, Irish and a writer, he's not simply a, an Irish writer in the way that the literary press likes to sort of categorize and, and manufacture as writers. So in the few short years since uh, Donald break on, broke onto the scene in 2012 with the publication of his first two novels, The Spinning Heart and The Thing About December, he has been gaining increasingly international reputation through stage ad adaptations and translations now of four novels and short stories in more than 20 languages. Uh, and in further recognition of that international reputation, Donald was awarded uh, the European Prize for Literature in 2015. Now there are writers who become famous because they win a number of these literary prizes. And you could certainly put Donald in that category. The Spinning Heart won a Guardian First Book Award. It was long listed for the Booker, Booker and the Desmond Elliott Prizes, shortlisted for the Impact International Literary Award. It was named Irish Book of the Year and then Irish Book of the Decade in, at the 2016 uh, Dublin Book Festival. Meanwhile, The Slanting of the Sun won, won an Irish Book Award uh, in the short story category. But it's not for the awards that he has won or will win, we're very confident in him, <laughs> that we've invited Donald uh, to read for us and much less engage in the acquisition of his archives. Um, because beyond writers who simply garner awards um, are those whom the literary critics esteem as significant. And I think we can certainly put Donald uh, in that category. Um, for me, significant writers are the ones who capture really the essence of their times. And, uh, and as a novel written about and even for post-Celtic Tiger Ireland, the, uh, the collapse um, that infected Ireland even more precipitously and, and harshly 
than our own economic and, and housing collapse here in the United States. Um, it documents that. It certainly does. It preserves that moment. It captures um, its essence. Um, and uh, with his background in law, which you may not have known about Durham, and I think you'll be telling us more about yourself uh, this evening around reading uh, selections of your work, um, has been profoundly affected um, by social crises of various kinds. So not just the, the boom and the bus cycle and in, in, uh, uh, in Celtic Tiger Ireland, but, but other types of, of social trauma, uh, very tuned into um, whether it's a mental illness in, in some cases, domestic abuse, violence, there's a dark side um, that's there in, in social crisis that you've seen firsthand and, and, and many people. And it's really uh, quite moving and in that sense um, captures again more of that social documentary or uh, I think you'll speak to us and been reading from your, your forthcoming novel here from the Low and Quiet Sea about how profoundly the Syrian refugee crisis has, has affected you. So, Donald, in that sense, is significant in, in, that, in that kind of social documentary side, if you will. Um, other writers are deemed significant really for their, the way they work with language. And I think Donald, in that respect, um, deserves our, our respect as uh, a significant writer for his uh, use of language um, and particularly in capturing uh, speech and dialogue in a very authentic way. You'll hear and read. Uh, from his novels that I would recommend for those of you who, uh, even if you've already read Donald's work um, in print, um, tune into Audible. Uh, there's some very, very fine recordings um, that have made, not in your voice, well, but in other readers who, who really captured that uh, uh, you know, authentic dialogue and speech. And it's, it's a really good uh, way to, to get into Donald's writing. So I really recommend that to you. Um, but it's, the, it's yet another category. It's really in transcending that, that we see not only significant writers, but important writers. And so that's how I would like to present uh, Donald to you uh, this evening as, as a reader, uh, as someone whose work really transcends uh, his own time and gets into those categories of the, uh, the universal um, and the transcendent and the truly human dimensions of our life, that, that love that goes uh, beyond death. And you find that in his character, so for as dark and, and disturbing as some of the experiences uh, his characters face, and he's bringing to you as a, as a reader and confronts you uh, with your own humanity. It's, there's, a, uh, there's a profound sense of, of hope, love that pervades that, a real empathy that you bring that, uh, uh, that transcends that. So that's how myself, as a reader, would like to present you, Laura Ryan. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, it really is an honor and a privilege to be here. Um, it's quite a life-changing experience, actually. Um, so I can't thank you enough. Um, I'd like to begin by reading a, a poem in Irish. Um, and I'm not a poet, and I don't speak very fluent Irish. So um, for the poets and the Gelgors in the audience, um, I apologize. Um, but it's written as um, a reaction to the recent uh, sudden passing of my dear father. Um, so it's called the kitchen um, falling. Um, Irish is a language that's been tuned over the ages to the complex rhythms of grief. Um, it is the most motherly of tongues. Uh, it offers warm and loving refuge to broken hearted. Um, but this poem is as much about hope as it is about grief. Um, and I'd like to, to dedicate a uh, reading of it to my dear friend, Ellen Hayes, who reminds me constantly um, of the infinite and eternal importance of hope. Ictichum. Tom Ictichum, as the Latinic which gave fame, August Ni Federalum, the Fuck of the Layer, Tom Flutcher, Traycam or Ashley. Tom Ictichum, one or done by Hail, August Ni Federalum, the Hashtoriella, Pushdal, Tom Alincha, Galer, Darmachago. Tom Ictichum, Mara Hit Maher, your diary of Curry Traum, August Honey Boss, and Frastelar. Tom Ictichum, she is Gadi and Hala Fodjok. Tom Imali, the mask on fair glass, Agus Tom Kuda. Ni Feder Lom Titchum Nis Widja. Talyona, Vogic Sheda. Agus Egumper, and Tasheda Goom. Fetum and Spare Nish. Tashi Traum is Gamble. Ak, Ta Isakum, Gul Chensaum. Gomeg and Spare, Sulair, Agus Gurm, Arish Amara. That's me, uh, my poetry career, nearly finished. Um, I'll read one more short poem at the very end, um, another one I wrote for that called Sweet Band, but 
In the meantime, I'll turn to fiction. Um, and this is my first novel. I was saying earlier that uh, John Mandel says that um, it's a curse for a writer to best known for his first novel. So I don't know exactly why it's such a curse, but I ban myself by saying it's not really my first novel because I wrote the thing about December before Spinning Heart. It's just that I decided to publish Spinning Heart first. Um, and Spinning Heart is a, a polyphonic novel. And I somehow managed to um, avoid the word polyphonic my whole life. Um, I'd, I'd written a novel in polyphonic form and it had been published and well received and won a few awards before I ever heard the word polyphonic. <laughs> it's really strange. I knew words like concupiscent and dialectic and tendentious. I didn't know polyphonic. And really, it's a very simple word to put together in your head, you know, if you're not shocked when you first hear it. Because, you know, obviously poly means many and phonics voices. But I was in London and I was feeling very clever and smug um, because they'd been nominated for the book. And I was thinking, sure, like, I mean, this, this is. This is the best thing ever, and, and, and like the world is champion of writing, basically. <laughs> work up now. And the journalist for the London Independent um, said, Donald, well, so why did you decide to write a novel in the funny, funny form? <laughs> 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 but luckily, my, my, my friend Connor had just given me a gift of an iPhone, um, and so I go to the restroom and Google the word funny, funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'll read. Um, if you could say a polyphonic novel has a main character, um, in this book it's a guy called uh, Bobby Mann. And um, I suppose Bobby is kind of a distillation of all the, the heroic, decent men in my life. Um, Bobby is the kind of man I wanted to be growing up. So there are parts of my father and my uncles and um, some of my friends and guys who are good at sports, basically. No, but you know, he's a very decent, straightforward, honest guy. And people look up to him. And so every character in the book really um, relates in some way to Bobby Mann, um, who appears kind of like a paragon of goodness and decency. Um, and no the novel is set in a village that has been held dead waste um, by the recession. And I saw it myself in a place called, just for example, a place called Karakari, called Limerick, um, around 09. You know, every single guy in the, in the village had worked for a small number of um, construction companies. And most builders and suppliers were very decent, and they went under and you know, they did their best to stay afloat, and they treated people very well, but some didn't. And Bobby has been a victim of an unscrupulous empire. So I'll read a very abridged version of, the, of Bobby's chapter um, in Spinning Heart. Now, he sounds quite dark, and he doesn't sound great to start, as he's thinking about killing his father, which is never good. <laughs> which is soon realized in a decent skin. <laughs> My father still lives back the road past the weir in the cottage I was reared in. I go there every day to see if he dead, and every day he lets me down. <laughs> he hasn't yet missed a day of letting me down. He smiles at me, that terrible smile. He knows I'm coming to check if he dead. He knows I know he knows. He laughs his crooked laugh. I ask, is he okay for everything, and he only laughs. We look at each other for a while, and when I can no longer stand the stench of him, I go away. Good luck, I say. I'll see you tomorrow. You will, he says back. I know I will. There's a red metal heart in the center of the low front gate, skewered on a rotating hinge. It's flaking now. The red is nearly gone. It needs to be scraped and sanded and painted and oiled. It still spins in the wind, though. I can hear it creak, creak, creak as I walk away, a flaking, creaking, spinning heart. When he dies, I'll get the cottage and the two acres that's left. He drank out Grandad's farm years ago. Once I have him buried, I'll burn down the cottage and piss on the embers, and I'll sell the two acres for as much as I can get. Every day he lives, lower is the price I'll get. He knows that too. He stays alive despite me. His heart is caked with muck, and his lungs are shriveled and black, but still he manages to draw in air and wheeze and cough and spit it back out. I was left go from my job two months ago, and it was the best medicine could have got. He gave him an extra six months, I'd say. If he ever finds out how Pokey Burke shafted me, he'll surely make a full recovery. Mm. Pokey could apply to be beatified then, having had a miracle ascribed to him. I was as smart as any of the passion heads in school. I was well able for the English and geography and history. All those equations in physics and maths made sense to me. I couldn't ever let on I knew anything, though. That would have been suicide in my head. I did pass Max, even though I know I could have done honours. I never once opened my mouth in English. A lad from the village wrote an essay one time, and Posy Rogers praised him from a height. 
He said it showed great flair and imagination. He got kicked the whole way back to the village. I had that King Lear's number from the start, well before the teacher started to break things down slowly for the tick lads. He was a stupid prick. He had it all and wanted more. He wanted the whole world to kiss his arse. I had Goneril and Regan pegged for bitches too, and I knew that Cordelia was the one who really, truly loved him. She wouldn't lie to him, no matter how much he wanted her to. You're a man and no more, she said. You're not perfect, but I love you. Cordelia was true of heart. There aren't too many Cordelias in this world, but Trina is one. I was scared before I knew I was, of facing down the works, and she told me. I was scared, imagine, even though I was in the right. Having a wife is great. You can say things to your wife that you never knew you thought. It just comes out of you. When the person you're talking to is like a part of yourself. We went to a play in Simon Town one time. I can't remember the name of it. You couldn't do that without a wife. Imagine it being found out that you went to see a play on your own. With a woman, you have an excuse for every kind of soft thing. <laughs> the play was about a man and a wife. They just sat on the stage, on either side of the table, facing the audience, talking about each other. Your man was like my father, only not as bad. The wife was lovely. She was dog tired of your man's all selfish ways, but still, she persevered with him. He sat there, drinking whiskey and smoking fag after fag, grinning back to his two ears as she read him to the audience. He had no smart reply for everything she said. They aged on stage as they were talking. I don't know how it was done. For a finish, they were both old and their lives were near spent. And at the very last, your man turned around and admitted he thought the world of her. He'd always loved her. He put his hand on her cheek and looked at her and cried. Christ, your man was so natural. On the way home in the car, tears spilled down my face. Trina just said, oh love, oh love. So that's Bobby. My old friend Bobby, he got me out of the right hole one time, so he did. Because uh, I was saying earlier, my motivation for writing Spinning Heart was quite cynical. I needed money badly. I was about 20 grand in debt, and I couldn't really pay it off because we'd lost a fair chunk of our household income um, after the uh, recession and the public sort of papers. And so I was thinking to myself, okay, I wrote a novel, I think about December, and my wife loves it, and my mum loves it, and that's, that's nearly enough, you know? Um, <laughs> really something that's this loved by my wife and my mum. Um, really felt like, you know, I had done my life's work as an artist. <laughs> <laughs> and so anything that happened after that was just icing on the cake. So I thought, okay, I mean, the thing I set out to do was done. Now I can write a novel just to make money. And unfortunately, that was, that was how I thought it was spinning art to start. But it, it became something else, really, you know, because the voices were all so familiar. And they were all voices of people so dear to me that it became a thing that was almost part of myself. So this is the thing about December. I started to write this book years ago. Um, and I started to write a book about what we call in North Tipperary, where I'm from, a bit of a god help us. So I suppose you could say the main character, John C. Cunliffe, is, you know, he's in some ways deficient. Um, but really, he's extremely insightful. He's just almost completely silent. And I know lots of people who are like that. You know, I know people from North Tipperary and rural Limerick who are almost fully silent but who have these, these raging internal dialogues. You know, they have all these things going on inside, and they're so astute and perceptive, and they're so attuned, but you'll never see it, you'll never hear it, because they just have got a very oblique way of dealing with the world. Um, so this novel is written, written in the calendrical form. It was described once as the worst novel ever written. <laughs> Which I thought was spectacularly unfair, to be honest. <laughs> there you go. That's the risk you run when you put it up there. So um, I'll read um, a little bit from, from March. So it's written into 12 chapters, 12 months of the year. Um, and in March, John Z is in very bad form. Um, he's, uh, his parents passed away, and he's, you know, he's, he's, he's kind of down in the dumps. Um, he's struggling, he's living alone on, on a farm. Um, the land he lives on that he's inherited is, is rezoned, so he's under this intense pressure because the book set at the start of our so called Celtic Tiger, um, and so land prices were inflating exponentially. Um, and everything was, you know, everything was artificial and constructed, and we had all these notions about ourselves, and land prices were just ridiculous. Um, but John Z is under pressure, and he feels this terrible um, 
inability to act. So at the start of each um, month in the, uh, in the novel, John Z reflects on how that month looked in his childhood before he describes how that month looks in the present moment. March. Christ does a great stretch in the evenings. March already imagine. March comes in like a lion and goes out like a lamb. He chases the year as pure solid flying. The worst of the cold is gone anyway, thanks be to God. Daddy would make these same observations every year to start of March. He would also give his predictions for the weather to come. The quantity and location of slugs and beetles and other creepy crawlies. The hop of a cock robin. The zigzag of rabbits and foxes across fields. The colour of the evening shadow cast by the Ara Mountains on the fields that cuddled up to their feet. The early or late departure or return of migrating birds and the height of their flight. All of these things and more spoke to Daddy of the temperament of the coming season in a secret language of signs and signals. Ara stops spouting, Mother would tell him, and roll her eyes towards heaven. But then you would hear her repeating Daddy's predictions word for word to her friends in the ICA while they drank tea and ate currant cake and clucked in the kitchen and they ooh and ah and wonder at Daddy's knowledge and skill and nod to each other knowingly and say now, how is it them feckers in the Met Office and all their smartness couldn't tell us that. <laughs> Loneliness covers the earth like a blanket. It flows in the stream down through the callows to the lake. It's in the muck at the yard, and the briars in the haggard, and the empty outbuildings are bursting with it. It runs down the walls inside the house like tears, and grows on the walls outside like a poison, choking weed. It's in the sky, and the stones, and the clouds, and the grass. The air is thick with it. You breathe it into your lungs, and you feel it might suffocate you. It runs into hollow places like rainwater. It settles on the grass, and on trees, and takes their shapes and all the earth is wet with it. It has a smell, like the inside of a saucepan, scraped metal, cold and sharp. When it hits you, it feels like a wrap of a hurley across your knuckles on a frosty winter's morning in P.E. Sharp, shocking pain, put inside you, so it can't be seen, and no one says sorry for causing it, nor asks are you okay, and no kind teacher wants to look at it and tell you it will be grand, good lad. But you know if another man stood where you're standing and looked at the same things, he wouldn't see it or feel it. He'd see that the fields are only wet with dew, and the walls only running because the vents are blocked with dirt and grime. And it's Virginia Creeper that climbs the house that people used to stop to admire for its lovely, fiery colours on their passage up the yard towards the front door. So it only exists in your head. It only occupies a tiny space. Is it even an inch squared? Probably not. How big could a feeling be? Not even as big as one of those atoms that science teacher used to be on about. It's nothing and everything at the same time. The world doesn't change or anything in it when someone dies. The mountains keep their still strength. The sun its heat, the rain its wetness. Blackbirds still hop and flutter about the back lawn, fighting over worms. The cat still screeches and paws at the back window for her grub. Bees still dance about the flowers and the apple trees, all of us searching, searching. There's an awful cruelty in the business of nature, the brutal sameness of things. The sky was the same blue the day after Daddy died as it was the day before. The uncaring rain didn't stop while they buried Mother, just bucketed ignorantly down and ran in muddy rivers from the height to the road below. So I fast forward to July where Johnson is cheered up considerably. <laughs> he has been hospitalized in the meantime, but he's met a nurse who he first of all calls a lovely voice because he can't see her, and finds out then her name is Siobhan. Um, and in this passage, um, I leave out some sentences because um, I, I always have a sense of my, my late grandmother at my right shoulder as I read in public. And she's always saying, don't be saying dirty words. <laughs> Don't make a show the family now, okay? So, you fill in the blanks. You know where you are. July. Oh yes, it was hurting. You all know what hurting is, don't you? Yeah, for the uninitiated, hurting is kind of a cross between, it's kind of like hockey, lacrosse, and murder. <laughs> it's a beautiful game. No school 
school in July. You could give every day knocking about the farm with Eddie. Oh, I have to say, actually, another explain. Um, John's either on 54 um, in the uh, fictive prisons, um, but he takes back his childhood at the start of the chapter. <clears throat> no school in July. You could give every day knocking about the farm with Eddie. Or if he was right busy or had to go off laying blocks, you could stay in the kitchen and Mother would help you. Sorry, Mother would allow you to sit in the rock top and watch her baking. Or you could walk over across the river field and seek to spot a rabbit or a hedgehog along with liches or maybe even a diving kingfisher. The sun didn't always split the stones, but even if it rained, it was never cold, and the earth would steam after it. And you could even swim while it rained. And you kind of know then how the wild animals felt being free. Daddy would bring Johnsy to the monster final, and Paddy Rourke would go with him as a rule. If it was on Cork, it stopped at the hotel in Mitchellstown on the way down for their breakfast. They always did a beautiful breakfast in the hotel. One time, Daddy was going mad, looking for more toast. But the waitress must have gone off of a break or something. So Daddy bowled off into the kitchen to make his own toast. <laughs> and Johnsy was scared in case he got into trouble. And Paddy shook his head and said, Your Daddy's a madman. <laughs> and a few minutes later, he came running back out with a big plate of toast and a load more rashers, and the one behind him waving a wooden spoon, Maria she was awful cross with him, but she was laughing, and Peggy and Johnsy roared laughing too, and there was a few more there, there in tip jerseys, and they all cheered, and it was a pure howl. <laughs> the picker Dunn would always be busting below, outside the stadium, with a big pile of wild-looking children, and Daddy was mad about him, and he'd always put money in their box, and salute the picker, and the picker Dunn would salute him back, and it wasn't everyone got a salute off the legendary Pecker Dunn, and Johnsy would be pure proud. If they bet Cork in the Munster final, Daddy would be as high as a kite on the way home. He'd shout, Whoa, boys, we've caught Beck in the hay saved! Now we have a proper summer. It's easy to be happy in July. Johnsy knew now what it was like to be in love. One way, hopeless love, he knew, but still love. It was like the time it had a stand-in teacher inside the tech, a little blonde lady, straight from university. She was a fine thing, all the tongue boys said, and they gave many a break time over to discussions of her. <laughs> Johnsy admired her brave talk, <laughs> but secretly he preferred her pale green eyes to any other part of her, and the soft sound of her voice. She read out this poem last one time, Johnsy never forgot what it was called, the dong with the luminous nose. It was about a woeful, ugly creature called the dong, who was head over heels in love with a beautiful woman who could never return his love. His love for her was unrequited. Miss had written that word on the blackboard and underlined it twice, and Johnsy had not forgotten the spelling nor its meaning, unrequited not returned, not given back. The whole class stayed quiet for that whole long poem. And afterwards, instead of guffaws and all smart comments, there was only a strange sort of silence. Like some kind of desperate sickness had befallen lads who just a few minutes previously had been full of the joys of spring. He was one of the thickest lads in that class. But even Johnsy knew where she was at. That little blonde lady from university that shining angel among all those dirty devils. She was telling them all they were only a shower of lovesick downs. And she also knew each one of them was in some way in love with her. And they could sail away in her little boats and drown themselves in a sea of longing for all she cared. She'd never returned their stupid, sweaty love. It was unrequited. <laughs> so that's for all Johnsy. Um, and, you know, I kind of based Johnsy as well on, on people I know saying that. And I heard Colin Devine saying on radio recently um, that you have to be ruthless, you have to be psychotic, you have to be divided conscience when it comes to writing fiction. You have to steal and plunder all around you, from your family and your friends, if you love, if you hate. Just steal, steal, steal all the time. So I do. <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote a book um, called All We Shall Know. Um, and I based it on kind of uh, a few different women in my life, all of whom I love. And I was very surprised when the book came out. People 
hated the main character, despised her, called her irredeemable and evil. <laughs> That's why she was great. I loved her. She was nice. <laughs> I know this is me. So All We Shall Know um, is a novel. It's uh, from the point of view of a pregnant woman. Um, she's, she's had an affair with a young traveller boy. She's been teaching to read and write. Um, so I suppose it's not a great start if you're going to make somebody be loved. Um, and she's on her own. And uh, she kind of muses about her life and her past. And she befriends a, a young girl called Mary Crottery, who's also a traveller. And I actually based the character of Mary Crottery on a traveller girl I knew, or, or kind of knew, because for all the travellers I've, I've known in my life, I've never really known any of them. But then I suppose, who can you ever really know? But Mary was based on a girl I knew who um, lived in a haunting site near where my friends lived. And whenever I went to visit my friends, and she saw us at the front door of the house talking, she'd come over to speak to us. Because she seemed kind of fascinated by us. She couldn't believe that four guys lived in a house with no wives. And they were all over 25. This was crazy. And she was very funny. And she always seemed a little bit cross with us for some reason, you know? So she'd talk, she'd laugh, and she'd cross, and she'd walk away. This, this went on for months and months, and eventually we never saw her again. But what we did gauge from the, the scant conversations we had was that she had kind of been sent to Coventry or cast out somehow from her community. And she'd done something unforgivable, or something that, that had to, you know, take time to be forgiven. And we're never sure what it was, but it was something to do with an engagement or marriage that had broken down. So at this point in the story of Melody She, it's called All We Shall Know. Originally it was called Melody She, but um, England said no one knows who you are at this point, right? I was in Ireland. So if we put Melody She by Donald Ryan on the cover, people won't know if it's Donald Ryan by Melody She, or Melody She by Donald Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> and so I opened my collected poems of Yeats, and I said the first line I see will be the title of the book, and luckily it was All We Shall Know, from the Newton song. But thanks to Yeats for that. <laughs> Steel of thunder. <laughs> and so this is arranged because I kind of I tend to rely on, on very strict um, arrangements for my for my books so that I don't do the plot and do the pace because I always find a very hard pace novels. Um, I spent I spent ten years living in a in an apartment that was haunted by ghosts who I knew fairly well, <laughs> and were pretty close to me in the ghost. Got on really well, and uh, it was quite romantic actually to live, you know alone in, in an apartment with a broken heart and a ghost company. Because, you know, I'd had various orphans, and I kind of had a broken heart a lot, to be honest. <laughs> so I spent 10 years in this apartment, and I was a frustrated writer, I was a civil servant, I had loads of time to spare, and whenever I tried to write a novel, it, never, it just never worked out. I always felt a little bit sick at everything I wrote. And it was too self-critical. But the one thing I could really not do was pace anything. My pacing was always the other place. So I decided I had to give myself a very strict structure whenever I write. And so that's why I've written in the clinical form, in the polyphonic form, and in this I followed the course of pregnancy from week 12 to uh, week 40. Because in Ireland, and I think in a lot of places, week 12 is when you traditionally announce your pregnancy, because you're kind of some way up the woods at that stage. It's, it's just a nice thing, so it starts on that week. So I'll read from week 35. At this point, um, Melody's husband has left her, and she had befriended um, a young traveller girl called Mary Pottery, who was in mortal danger because of a feud between her family and another family. And Melody and Mary have moved in with Melody's father. The fatness of me suddenly, all swollen and puckered and filled. Dad gives me sausages and rashers and fried eggs and white toast buttered thick and coffee with sugar and cream in the mornings and chops, or steaks, or chicken, roasted in its crackling skin and draped with bacon, with spuds and gravy and vegetables mashed to a buttery, salty paste in the evenings. And he makes me graze all day on sandwiches, daintily cut and filled with dangerous, delicious things, and slices of slathered fruitcake. Mary Crottery watches wide-eyed, picking like a sparrow, and says, Lord, save us, miss. You're the size of a house. <laughs> You'll have iron and death before this baby is out. <laughs> and my father laughs at all her proclamations and says, Mary, you look hard. I stood today in the kitchen, watching out the window from the sink. Daddy was standing, facing the hedge at the bottom of the garden, where the maples and the elderberry meet. And he was gesturing, making little pictures with his hands. It seemed as though he was talking to himself, or to someone who was hidden in the greenery. But then I saw Mary, 
sitting on the bench behind him, half hidden by the last tinder row of apple trees that bisects the garden. And she was facing back, looking at him while he talked, with one leg tucked beneath her, her arms crossed on the top board of the bench back, her chin resting on them. Now and then she seemed to laugh, or to shake her head in wonder. And I knew that Dad was explaining something about the wildlife of the hedgerow, or the flowers or the plants, and I imagined myself in Mary's place, bored, impatient, willing him to stop. And I felt a little bolt of pain, a singeing moment of regret. And then they both were silent, and Mary's chin was raised now from her arms, and they were watching a spot beside the trunk of the maple tree, and they were perfectly still. And after a long moment, a minute or so, my father turned slowly around to her, and he was smiling, and Mary had one hand across her mouth, and her eyes were opened wide. They walked together back along the gentle slope to the house, and they seemed so easy in each other's company. I half expected her to link his arm, but I knew she never would. It's not a thing that she would ever do. I know this for a fact, and yet I don't know how or why I know. They came into the kitchen, carrying cut grass in their shoes, and I gave out to them. And Dad rolled his eyes and sighed, and shook his head in mock censure. And Mary laughed at his little act, and towed her heels to slip her runners off, and stood there in her stonewashed jeans and her pink hoodie, and her bare feet with her toenails painted red. And Dad stood behind her saying, Abbeys, Abbeys, she's with good luck at the bees, hadn't we, Mary? And Mary's eyes were shining and burning with some excitement, something she had to say to me that she'd learned just moments ago to see if I knew this wondrous thing that she now knew. And the sky and the earth and the cut grass, and the chirping of birds, and the low drone of insects, and the slant of light across my father's happy face, and the gleam of wonder in Mary Crattery's eyes, and the smell of the morning air, and the weight of life inside me, all seemed even, and easy, and massless, and perfect, and right, and every deficit seemed closed in that moment. So I'm going to read from a short story um, called Tommy and Moon, um, and it's actually, I know I keep quoting John Mandel, I should stop reading, but um, I heard John Mandel saying recently, it's a shame of every single thing he ever wrote. He doesn't mean it at all. <laughs> but, uh, I meant to say that, because I mean, he's amazing. We all know that. And you know, I kind of feel there's some truth in it, because I look back at things I wrote and I go, God, I could have done it better. But you know, we have this thing, we're oppressed by infinity as writers, because there is infinite possibility. Fiction offers infinite possibility. We can say anything in any way. Um, there's a nominal number given to the number of words in English, and it's a million. I think Oxford said about six years ago that the number of words in English had nominally passed the million mark. So if you consider that number of words and the possibility of combinations of those words and sentences, it's, it's almost infinite. It's as good as infinite. And this knowledge, actually, instead of being liberating, counterintuitively, can be very oppressive. <coughs> There's literally every story out there waiting to be told. I can say anything, I can do anything with fiction. So what the hell do I do? And most often you do nothing. You say, oh no, it's just too much. And then when you do something, you think, well, I could have done it so many other ways. You know, was this the best way to do it? But I got a commission once from the BBC, and because of the BBC, it's like a kind of panic, you know? <clears throat> Because you kind of, you don't really trust the BBC management. <laughs> and actually, um, I'm not sure actually I have um, public performance rights to this story because uh, I never read the contract. So <laughs> if you read anything from the BBC, just don't mention it. You heard me read this topic. <laughs> Tommy and Moon. So it's based actually on an uncle of my, of my wife's called Dan Murphy. And Dan was a person who had a real profound effect on me. And you know, I only met Dan a handful of times before he died. But he was so tuned in to the world, to nature, and to existence. And he was a very quiet man. He was another person that people would possibly very glibly dismiss as a god help us. You know, somebody who was just to be written off, kind of, just to be kind of laughed at almost. You know, he could be really good reasoning, because he was a very, very quiet man who lived in a cottage, you know, on a, on a back road, and walked the fields every day and looked at animals and drew pictures. And when Dan died, my mother-in-law and her sister opened a huge chest like his bed. It was full of books on ornithology and science and physics and novels, you know, and literature. And he was just he was just the most amazingly well-read man. But nobody would know that about him. So I based this 
story, tell me a moon, and then. So I just read extracts from the story. So hopefully you get a flavor of the story and who then was. And it's actually narrated by uh, a writer who's suffering from writer's block. And at the time, I was badly stuck, Ernest. And this kind of opened up for me because of the fact and the pressure, the pressure of uh, a commission from the BBC. <laughs> I rented a house for a year one time, at the very edge of the town, and I met friends by dint of passing up and down with a man who lived in a small holding down the road. I was meant to be writing a book, but I wasn't able, and so I walked and waited for the words to come back to me. I'd been paid in advance, and the weight of expectation attached to it had crippled me. Tommy was up on 80, I'd say, though he never spoke of his age. He was sprightly and lean, and he had most of his hair, and he kept it carefully combed. And he tried never to show me his pain, but I felt it. And he told me things in fits and starts across the ancient table in the kitchen of the cottage his grandfather built. Tommy had a friend he called Moon. They'd fallen out of their boyhood and never fully met up. Moon wouldn't step in here to this house the way you do told me, and sit down there and drink a cup of tea. Moon was from Big Land, from a right swanky crowd. I often met Moon at the road with the cross before Tommy's. He lay a cold eye on me as he passed on his bicycle, straight backed and stately. And the odd day, Tommy would be keeping an eye out for me from his garden gate, and I'd hear them exchange terse comments on the weather. And Tommy would show me caricatures he'd drawn of Moon with a steady and skillful hand. And he'd say, look how stupid Moon looks in this picture. <laughs> Have you ever seen anyone the like of the Moon? And I'd allow that I hadn't. And Tommy would shake his head in mock sadness and crumple his picture and fling it into the grate for fear at all, he'd say, and nod towards the door and wink at me. When the Griffins were all gone, his neighbors one time and the far side from me, their house and bit of land fell to a cousin from town who set it and sold the cottage to a queer crowd, Jehovah's Witnesses. They came to Tommy's door one time and frightened him with their litany of certitudes. The things that were going to happen to him, and not one thing could he do to save himself unless he was born again. Lord God, he said to them, bad enough to be born the once. <laughs> but he hadn't the heart to run them all the same. There was a woman he'd have liked to marry, but he knew no way to cover the ground between them, and nor did she. He read a thing in a book one time about a tribe in Africa who considered themselves to be the rightful owners of all the cattle in the world. He thought often about them, at the mart, in the meadow, fathering the cattle he was guardian, not owner of, in the unknowable minds of those lean, dark, nearly naked herders. He imagined himself going to where they lived, to their plain of sand, grass, and prickly bushes, circled by jungles and low hills. What would they make of him if he rose white-faced and wellington-booted out from the undergrowth into the light of their campfire? Would they laugh at him or welcome him, thank him for fattening their Frisians half a world away? Would they call him brother? Would they kill him? There now would be a death, speared, bleeding out beneath a white-hot sun, turned quickly to carrion, flesh torn from bone by savage jaws and sighting beaks, his sun-bleached skull saved to adorn a secret temple wall. He'd melt back to molecules in the bellies of beasts and be spread with their spoor across the savannah along their ancient trails. He said, wouldn't that be a glorious exequy? And I was startled to quietness by the word, by his words, by the talk of it. He kept a hawk once that he found by a river on the edge of death. The risk to its wing was too pronounced and there were balls of light shot in the mental of it. He straightened and set the wrist of the hawk's wing with an elastic band and a strip of cardboard, and plucked out the shot with tweezers, and fed it bits of raw chicken, and sat still and silent for days and nights with the hawk perched on his hand. The arm of an old coat he fashioned and sewed and used on his hand in place of the leather glove used by professionals. He tamed it by instinct, and by echoes of memories of things told to him in childhood, he knew to be still, to hood the bird between meals, so it would associate the sight of him with food. To gradually show the bird the world, perched all the while on his hand, he flew the hawk free when it had the full of its head back, and his heart thumped until it looped around against the sun and swooped back to him. It lived with him for seven years, 
in the back kitchen and a stout perch he'd made from boughs of oak, where it would meet his eyes sometimes and hold them and tell him in its dark silence all the things about the world could be known by a bird of prey and tell him that it loved him, pure and perfect. The hawk flew in one summer evening, wet with blood, full of shotgun pellets, and died. It had come back to him to see could he save it again, and he couldn't, and his breath went from him, and his reason for a time, and the world tilted a bit and never fully righted. He could never keep a pet again after that. A few odd tabbies mooched in around the yard, and the odd time fed him scraps, but they never belonged to him. He never loved them, nor they him. And a few old cattle came and went, and he never petted them the way some do. Time occupied him. The notion of it being a thing. How was it? All that's real is the present moment. What's a moment? A thing infinitely divisible downwards. So the smallest part of a moment doesn't exist. So a moment doesn't exist. So time doesn't exist. Only the trick the mind plays in itself to stop all things seeming to happen at once. These are the things an evening can hang on that can give form to an hour of standing at the haggard gate, leaning, resting a foot on the second bar up, regarding thistles and bees and distant mountains with a level eye. The idea that everything has happened and nothing has happened yet. That existence is a singularity of infinite smallness. That mam and dad are still alive and were never born. That the hawk is out hunting and might come home yet. The seeming uselessness of existing occurred often to him. The depth of the water at the bend of the river occurred often to him, where it seemed sometimes in flood to flow back on itself, to rage against its own rushing. The coils of rope in the lock of the barn, the discs of poison led for rats, but yet each morning hope peeled from the eastern sky and rang all day in his ears, or for as much of each day as was needed. And so I'll finish up by reading, well, almost finished now, just a short extract from, from Alone and Quiet Sea, which is coming out uh, next March, yeah, next month in um, Ireland and the UK in Commonwealth and in July in, in the States. Um, and so the first section, is, it's a book in three sections, um, and the first section is about a Syrian refugee who's coming to Ireland and what happens to him. So it's based on a true story, actually, um, about a guy, I read about a guy who, um, at the start of the conflict in Syria, um, gave all of his money to a so-called high-end human trafficker, um, a grisly phrase, but uh, there you go. And so he was told that the boat that would take him and his wife and daughter across the Mediterranean would be sound. It would be almost like a pleasure cruise. And halfway across to a big island um, from the Turkish coast, they hit bad weather. And so he and another passenger went to the bridge to confront the captain and crew about the uh, situation and realized that the boat was unmanned, uncrewed, that it was hooked up to a GPS system and that was steering them across the Mediterranean. But of course the boat sank and his wife and daughter were drowned. So yeah, I, I read the story, it was a very small story in The Guardian. And I, I felt I needed to tell the story, to make this a bigger story than it was. But then I was thinking, this is my story, can I take this, can I do this? I'm still not sure, to be honest. Okay. Of course, the last occasion I was on my own um, talk. Okay. So at this point, um, Farouk and his wife and daughter are in the hold. And his wife's telling his daughter a story. The sobbing lies was in his ears a while before he realized it was coming from his daughter. His wife had been speaking to her in a low voice, a story about a girl who'd been taken prisoner by a king who wanted to marry her. But he was old and very ugly, and she would never love him. So he kept her locked away in a room in a tower filled with pretty things, all sorts of jewelry and clothes and musical instruments. And performers and clowns and storytellers were sent every day to amuse her. But she spent her days sitting by a window feeding a tiny bird that landed on the sill and whispering to the bird. And the king would visit in the evening, but the girl would never speak to him. And he asked his best archer to kill the bird one day. And he watched from afar through a looking glass as a slender arrow pierced the bird's breast right there in the windowsill as the girl was whispering to it. And he watched as she sat there crying silently for hours. And her tears formed a pool around the bird's little body. 
and eventually the king regretted what he had done, and he tried to command all the birds of the sky to visit the girl and to sit on her sill while she whispered to them. But the birds wouldn't listen. They wouldn't even stay still while he shouted at the sky and the trees, and the king's rage flooded through him and drove him insane, and he asked all of his archers to kill every bird in the kingdom, and they obeyed him because they were afraid of him. And the killing of the birds took years and years and cost the king all his gold and all his castles because he had to recruit archers from all over the world to kill the birds. But eventually the skies of the kingdom were empty and birdsong was never heard again. And the king was a feeble old man living in a tiny shack in a silent forest. And the girl had long since escaped the tower and returned to her home and her family. And the king had long forgotten why he hated birds so much, why he had killed them all why he had lost his very kingdom in the cause of their annihilation. And Farouk wondered why Marta had chosen a story so sad, why she had made her daughter cry. And he re realized that every other passenger had fallen silent, and they were all looking now at his wife. And the only light there in the hold was from the slit along the jam of the hatch above them, and from the torches of phones. But he could see that some of the women and the girls had tears in their eyes and some of the men had thoughtful expressions, and some looked angry, and the only sound was his daughter's low sobs as she clung fast to her mother, and the sound of his wife saying, Hush, love, it's not a true story, it's a fable, and its moral is how useless it is to blame others for things not being as we'd like them to be. And then a man stood, and Farouk expected him to rebuke Martha for telling such a story, and he prepared himself to defend his wife, to cut the man down to size, to tell him to be quiet, and to keep his whining to himself. <clears throat> he should be ashamed of himself for taking so to heart a story told by a woman to her child. But the complaining man just said, the life jackets. We gave them to that boy because he said they'd be replaced. Come on, my friends, we have to see the captain and the crew. We can't just sit here in the dark like fools. And another voice behind him said, there are no life jackets on this boat. There is no captain, there is no crew. There's nothing on this boat but us. So I'll finish up with the definite end of my career's report. Um, <laughs> a short poem called Sweet Van, in loving memory of Tony Ryan. My dad had the coolest job any dad could have when I was a kid. He, he was a confectionery salesman, so he drove a van full of sweets around the country. In the summer, I was waiting. <clears throat> Sweet Van. Einstein said time was an illusion anyway. So somewhere, we're still picking stock from the shelves of Peggy Hogan's warehouse. Then, driving west, across the Shannon, over the clanking boards of the bridge at Portunda, my eyes closed against the fear of falling through. You're still singing Big John with the sun warm on your face through the windscreen. I'm still holding back my tears at the bit where Big John dies to save the other miners. Because a boy old enough to go to work with his dad is too old to be crying at songs. Not that you'd ever have minded my tears. You'd have laughed and reached a hairy knuckled hand across, swiped it gently down my face, and sang a different song. In Einstein's time, you're singing still. Thank you. And um, actually, just as, a, as an encouragement to ask anything, uh, my wife gets cross with me all the time for being too honest. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I, mean, I can't lie, I just can't do it. So uh, anything you ask, I give you a completely brutally honest answer. I can't even obfuscate these days, and just put you a to me. Intentionally, like, try to meet people to like 
add variety to your life? Yeah, it's a good question actually. And you know, I know writers who are kind of hermits, really. Um, I know one writer who has a very wealthy patron who donated a cottage in the country to him, and he, he lives there and he eats cheese. That's all he eats, really. He's no money. And he, he very rarely meets people. Um, he goes to the odd book lunch where he drinks as much wine as he can and eats as many canapes as he can. And he, he writes the most amazing prose, and he has the most. He has these visceral insights about humanity. It's amazing. I don't know how he does it. Maybe it's just an inborn with him, but for me, I need, I need to meet people all right. You know, I definitely have to have a store experience to draw upon. But having said that, I mean, it's, it's a kind of a, a glib um, piece of advice given to, sometimes given to students of creative writing, to write what you know. I mean, by doing that, you will narrow your, your range of experience, you know, that you will create, turn into fiction very much. So I think it's, it's always good to have a starting off point of something you know very well, or think you know very well. But as Colin McCann says, it's very important to always write towards what you don't know. You know, try to discover things yourself, because I mean, literature is literally the casting of light. You know, and it will always necessarily be a fairly dim light. I mean, we're not going to be, we're not going to illuminate anything completely so it's totally known, because we can never know anything for sure. You know, it's one of those conundrums. I mean, how, how can you ever know how it is to be somebody else? And so fiction is just a series of guesses all the time, or just trying to to grasp that that it's some fundamental truth about, about other people. But you kind of have to be, yeah, you kind of have to get <coughs> there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, your talk was uh, really very, very moving readings. Um, I, I think sometimes it must be really difficult for uh, for anybody to elbow their way out to the, the very crowded stage for mm -hmm. of Irish writers that you have today. And still, you you managed to do it to carve out a space for yourself, and done it successfully. What 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 would you say that you bring to it that that's enabled you to to do this? In this yeah, you're very thick headed, really. Yeah, as my dad said to me, pure ignorance, you know, just back them all. But it is, it's quite a stage, all right, Chad. I mean, someone said to me the other day, "What's the point of being a writer?" I mean, there are so many books out there. At the moment, there are about eight million books in print. You know, how many million books have been written? So what's the point to tell more stories? But it's just, it's a very, it's, it's a very human impulse narrative. You know, and in a way it's quite an unnatural thing. I mean, we're trying to impose order and chaos. We're trying to make all these incoherent, incoherent happenings seem like things with a pattern. You know, and that's, that's why we always, that's why we tell stories. I think it's why we've always told stories before language even there were stories. And so we're never going to stop. But it is, I mean, you know, I think it's just important not to think about art in terms of competition. You know, even though that's the way it, it, it's going to happen. Once you let it out there, it's going to be in competition with other things, television and, and, and every sort of media. And you know, I mean, the way people experience stories now is, is, is reducing, reducing, you know. And narrative actually is taken a bit of bashing at the moment, in some ways. But then, we, you know, we have a very, sometimes we can have a, you know, maybe an overly traditional sense of what narrative is or how it should be presented, because there are so many ways to tell stories. I was very lucky, to be honest. You know, I mean, I was talking earlier about how, how um, Sarah Davis Goff, who had done found Tram Press, who even in her infancy is, you know, kind of a, an iconic outfit. Um, she was an intern at the Duke of Press when she happened to pick up um, the manuscript of The Thing About Summer. You know, and she, and she lobbied her employer, Anthony Farrell, to publish it. And he did. You know, he sold rights to the Penguin. Went from there. I was, you know, I, I had huge, huge luck. I, I had kind of laughing levels of luck, really. So you need to have a bit of luck, and you need to be a bit thick-headed, and you need to be a bit um, thick-skinned. I'm not actually thick-skinned at all, I'm very sensitive. <laughs> That's one of the terrible dichotomies we face as writers, you know, because you need to have a certain level of kind of finely tuned sense of empathy. You need to be open to things, and you will be open to pain and to rejection and to all the horrors of, of, of being judged by people who are met you. So, and it's, it's kind of hard to close that out sometimes. I got to know those women. <laughs> no, I always did. I mean, I'm not really sure. Um, 
I literally just, I, I, I have a kind of a, a process where I try to inhabit as fully as possible the character I'm writing. And, and I, I divest myself of all certainties because I do feel that certainty is an to creativity very often. And I, I see people these days who are well intentioned but are, are stuffed almost to bursting with certainties, you know, with shibboleths, with things they hold to be absolutely inviolable, you know, and they can't be argue, argued against. And I, 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 I kind of I try to avoid that state of being. So everything is a question to me. And so when I try to inhabit the character I'm writing, I ask how would this character react to this situation? How would it feel to be in this situation? Because you never really know. You just get your best stab possible at it. And also, um, I, I rely on my wife. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. You should have started. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. My wife and my mom, my two uh, harshest critics and, and greatest supporters. Uh, yeah. So this kind of... Uh, It's a novel in three parts. Um, it's, it's, it's about three men, Farouk, Lampy, and John. And Farouk is, his story is, as I described, um, Lampy is a bus driver in Limerick, and John is a former political lobbyist. And their stories converge, they don't tell at the end. You know, and it's not really about the ending, it's about their individual journeys through life and in that moment. But um, when it came to writing a Syrian character, I was, I, I was really upset by I am upset by Syria. I was, I was kind of obsessed with the town of Aleppo. And I, I, I said I had a story called Long Puff, actually, in Aleppo a few years ago. And uh, I didn't do very assiduous research for it. Because I find when I research things too deeply, I start to be didactic and a little bit telly, as any writer would say about it. I start to try to tell the reader everything about this thing or this place or this time. And it, it stopped being fiction, it stopped being a story. So I didn't um, go too deeply into um, place. Or, or the culture, or even the topography. Um, I just wrote a story called Long Pop about a Catholic priest who befriends young boys in this town, or you know, teenage boys in the town of Aleppo, and he starts to play early, and he starts to have long pop competitions to see who can hit it early, or shoot her fat farthest with early. Um, and I was asked to read the story in the town of Turles in Tipperary, where about 80 um, Syrian people had resettled. Um, and as I read, I was starting to sweat, and I was thinking, God, I'm really going to get found out here now. <laughs> <laughs> I really rumbled now, you know. My, 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 my laziness for research is going to really bite me now, you know, in a few minutes. And I finished the story, and they stand up and say, who do you are? And so I finished the story, and a lady says, I don't believe your story for a second. I, it doesn't sound right to me. But it turned out she was Irish, and she'd never been to Syria either, so. <laughs> 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 and this beautiful Syrian lady stood up, and she saved me. She was an angel. She said, I'm very surprised to hear that Donald hasn't lived in Aleppo because he described it so exactly correctly. She said, I felt like I was home again. <laughs> oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> so I was very lucky. But I felt a greater obligation when I came to Farouk, to be honest, um, to get it right. And so, I mean, I based Farouk on, on, on actual, an actual story. I mean, the story I appropriated from a new story. Well, I, I, I think I got the voice very right, and I got Farouk's thought process very right, and, and the process of grief. Like, I, I didn't experience visceral grief until very recently, and I, I've been writing about grief for years, you know, and it was a strange experience, to be honest, to have this book written, a book that's kind of about grief, and then, you know, to have it finished and printed and bound before I experienced actual real grief myself. And I was kind of heartened, to be honest, in a very strange way, Think that yeah, I, I, I mentioned it correctly. This is how bad it is. Um, and so I, you know, I did. I, I feel that the obligation that I felt towards Farouk, um, I feel that telling the story, it, it, it paid off. I think. You know, I, I think it, it might do some good. It's a tiny modicum of good. It might, it might make these stories less of a thing that just happens every day. 
because we hear stories all the time, we hear numbers now. It's all statistics about the combustion went down and the souls that were saved, the souls that were lost. And the Mediterranean, the area between Turkey and Syria and, and, and Europe is it's a great graveyard. Nobody we're, we're becoming immune and inured to it, like we do to all conflicts, really. Because we have to kind of ignore it a little bit. If we let all these things assail us, we couldn't exist. Well, if there are no more questions, um, thank you so much for coming. It's a pleasure. I mentioned on the way in, of course, that Bullet Boston uh, coming up uh, two weekends, uh, and Jason's uh, symposium and uh, other things. So I wanted to mention, uh, especially with many students being here this evening, we have um, this weekend, uh, Saturday, I don't know what you have, Kathy is participating in our graduate student uh, conference all day uh, at Connolly House, uh, right, James? And that um, under the term of living Irishness. So it'll be really wonderful when we have onto the work and stuff at the end of that. Uh, uh, that day there, so please uh, look at that. It's uh, well, let's see, look on the social media in particular, the posts from campus. So, Living Irish is calling out starting at the as well. Right. Oh, right. So, beginning, I think, at 9 a.m. right on, um, on Saturday, okay. And then, um, I'm reminded by the redoubtable Joe Nugent that we have uh, Saturday, April 21st, right? Our uh, Joyce and Journalism will be the theme this year for the annual Joyce Symposium. Um, so who might be guests would come to it, the Joyce and Journalism concept <laughs> conference. Uh, maybe Finch and O'Toole will be there. Uh, maybe we'll see our own local uh, Charlie Sennett uh, will be there, and then some other uh, characters we, we see regularly, like Joe Valenti, and, uh, and uh, also Gary Leonard, I guess, from the University of Thomas. So thank you, that'll be the uh, Saturday, the 21st there. Um, but now back to you, Donald, all right? So another 